Writers on Writing. Writers on Writing comes to you from the studios of Megar Evers College over the airways of WNYE 91.5 FM. We come to you every Sunday and give you, our listening audience, an opportunity to hear writers from the African diaspora talk about their work, their lives, and their craft. And I am your host, Brenda Green, director of the National Black Writers Conference and executive director of the Center for Black Literature. Very pleased to have on the telephone with me this evening, Marita Golden. Welcome, Marita. I'm glad to be here, Brenda. Yeah, it's really, really good to have you back again. Yeah, I know you have been on the program before, and I love talking to you about books and writing. Yes, and you also were our keynote speaker for our last National Black Writers Conference in 2006 on race, identity, history, and genre. And Marita um, is a a very uh, well-known writer. She has over 12 works of fiction and nonfiction. And um, her most recent book that we're going to be focusing on is After, which um, I'll let Marita share with you some awards. It's it's one. Um, But uh, Marita is is primarily known for um, is primarily known for fiction and nonfiction. And I was first introduced to you many years ago when I was in school, an undergraduate, in your book Migrations of the Heart, which really, uh, as I always tell you, touched me dif- uh, deeply, as you're known for really drawing from your your own life in terms of um, focusing on stories that, as you say, deepen and and correct the often one-dimensional stereotype, stereotypical images of African Americans. And I think you, you just do that from a variety of perspectives. So I always find that your stories are, are really, uh, really touch home and are very authentic and, and very reality-based. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Um, why don't we just share with you, after um, a novel is um, a story that really... Uh, focuses on some uh, critical issues in our society today around police and violence and police brutality and father-son relationships. But just share with us what awards it's recently won. Well, uh, AFTER was the recipient of the uh, Fiction Award from the Black Caucus of the American Library Association, and it was also nominated for in the category of Outstanding Fiction for an NAACP Image Award. So uh, this is a book that took a lot uh, out of me to write. Uh, so I was very pleased that the reception, the reviews have been excellent and um, to, to, get, to garner this type of um, recognition for it has been very satisfying. Okay. And you, you st- let's start with that. You said it took a lot of out of you to write. What motivated you to tell this story? Because I think what makes it really interesting is is looking at the interior life of a black police officer. What motivated you to tell this story, and and why did it take so much out of you? Well, actually, the story, the process of writing was inspired uh, back in 2000 when a young man named Prince Jones, a college student at Howard University, was shot in a horrible incident here in the Washington, D.C. area by an African-American police officer uh, who followed him through three jurisdictions and in a confrontation ended up shooting him in the back six times and killing him. And it was an incident that was quite high profile down here in the area of Washington, D.C., Maryland, Virginia. And during the 2000 election, uh, presidential candidate Al Gore even referenced it in his uh, in talking about police brutality. So given the fact that it was such a high profile case, and like many people in the black community, um, my I have a son who had been the victim of police brutality. I just was curious about the whole question of, you know, how a family would go on after a, an incident like that happened. So the original story was actually going to be just the story of a fictional family dealing with 
the aftermath of a terrible tragedy like that. And when I got into the actual writing, about a year and a half into the writing, it became pretty apparent that the police officer in this fictional story, who was a minor character, was actually the most compelling character, the most interesting, the most surprising character. And uh, my editors at Doubleday kept telling me that he really should be more prominent, that the story really belonged to him. Uh, and so it took me a while to accept that because that uh, didn't jive with my preconceived notion of the story I wanted to tell. But the more I wrote, it was true that the more complex the story became, the more multi-layered. And writing the story of the aftermath of a tragedy like that from the perspective of the police officer gave me an opportunity to write a book that um, not a lot of African-American writers had dealt with um, a story that dealt with a police officer shooting an African-American man and looking at the emotional trauma, not just from the perspective of the victim and the victim's family, but from the police officer. And it took a lot out of me in that it took a lot of my preconceived notions about police officers and police work out of me and replaced uh, those stereotyped preconceived notions with a much deeper, more complex sense of um, our shared humanity. Mm -hmm. And and that's, of course, what what makes this book um, very, very unique. It's almost like the secrets or the the airing airing of the laundry that you don't want to to, uh, let the public know about. But it's something I'm sure that all of us have police officers in our families. And, Good point. You know, and we all we we get we know the other perspective, but we don't talk about it really. Exactly. I mean, in the black community, because of the historically very troubled relationship that we've had with police, the police, there's often a tendency to have a knee jerk reaction um, and yet police officers, I, I interviewed over a dozen police officers, um, men and women, mostly African-American, but uh, some white officers as well, and found out that they are, they are professionals who have one of the hardest jobs that anybody could possibly have, uh, and that they have a job that it's very easy for people who are on the outside looking at them perform that job to criticize and critique um, but very few of us c- could perform the job that they do. I also found out that there are many that often when we read about these cases of high profile uh, instances of brutality or lethal force, it's usually the same officers over and over again. Uh, the average police officer never ever in a say for example a fifteen or twenty year career ever fires their weapon. It is the um, exception rather than the rule. And often the cases of brutality and lethal force are committed by the same bit, cops over and over again. So in talking to the police, these police officers, I found a very, very rich story. Um, and the story of, is really, even though it is a story of a police officer and his emotional journey, um, how he's going to live his life, uh, having basically having killed a man because he thought he had a gun and he had a cell phone, how do you live with that? And that's a question that anybody has to answer when they've committed an act that is so tragic. Right. Just give us the basic outline of the story. And um, there's another question I want to ask you related to that. Just share with the audience the basic outline of the story. Well, the story opens uh, with, actually opens with the shooting of this young man during a police stop. And then it uh, moves into looking at the specific ways in which the shooting impacts the life of the protagonist, Carson Blake, everything from uh, how he's put on administrative leave to the impact of it on his marriage. Uh, He suffers enormous post-traumatic stress. Uh, He attempts suicide. Uh, He eventually leaves the force and then has to reshape his life. And the other aspect of the story, uh, the other aspect of him as a character, is that there are all these ghosts from his past, uh, his childhood, that impact his relationship with his son. And it's really about a journey into um, change and growth 
and acceptance and forgiveness, which are all issues that we all deal with um, in our lives. Right, and that's that's one of that's definitely a a uh, strength that you have in your writing is is always your characters um, explore these inner turmoil, the inner turmoil in their life and the inner conflicts. And they very often are journeys um, that force them to change and transform. I think one of the interesting things about this uh, novel is that you do bring in, as you said, he attempts suicide and you bring in the fact that he ends up having to deal with therapy, another sort of taboo topic in the black community. Right. And it's very taboo on the police force. I mean, the irony is that uh, police officers have one of the most stressful jobs you could imagine, and yet uh, they they are considered weak or um, damaged if they seek out professional help. I was aided a lot in my portrayal of the character by conversations I had with a uh, therapist who works with the police force in Washington, D.C. Now, in Washington, D.C., any time a police officer uh, fires his weapon, even if he doesn't kill or wound anyone, he has to go to talk about this with the therapist because it's, it's assumed that, well, police officers walk around with guns, so shooting anybody is no big thing. Shooting someone is no big thing. But whenever you take a life, whenever you wound a person, uh, in some way, you've dramatically shifted your emotional universe. Uh, police officers are trained to use force, but only in the, ex- the most extreme situations. And just as the young men and women who are in Iraq sir, uh, are often damaged psychologically from having had to use lethal force, so firefighters who, who see people in the worst, most damaged situations often suffer post-traumatic stress. Police officers, the same thing. So anybody that we put in these situations, these life and death situations, their emotions are deeply, deeply impacted. But ironically, the, the police force does not, in most uh, cities does not make a space where this can be addressed. Right. Right. Um, we're going to have to take a, a break in a short moment, but I wanted to um, you also to comment on the fact that this this book is also about how we the relationship between police officer police officers and black youth in our community and and really um, I was reminded in reading the story about of course the Amandu Diallo. Uh, case, which was very, very high profile in our community, the 41 mm-hmm. shots. And then, of course, uh, more recently, Sean Bell right. uh, is on the eve of his um, wedding, right. you know, being shot. So the, the reaction and the relationship of police officers to youth and how that's even more complicated when you have an African-American police officer who's dealing with youth. I don't know if, if um, you've had this experience, but I know sometimes, particularly when my son was growing up, I always I would have to do a double take sometimes, thinking I saw him, and it was someone else, you know. And and as a, as a black woman, is you know that that we sometimes the 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 perceptions that we often even have mm-hmm. of of the black youth. I think you've you've shown. So the how fact to, is that the police profile. I mean, they simply I, they simply do profile. Uh, if they see a carload of young black males, they will. Uh, look at that car more closely. They may follow it. Uh, if there's a, if there's a boombox playing in the car, there's a lot of movement. And so, the African American police officers were very frank with me about the fact that yes, they do profile. Um, they didn't say it necessarily with with pride, but simply as a fait accompli. And we know that if they're profiling, they're more likely to. Um, use legal force with, 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 with young black men, treat young black men very differently. And we, we know that there's two standards of performance, that things happen in the black community around uh, the police and citizens that never happen in the white community. Uh, white, white police officers never get shot accidentally when they're in plain clothes by another police officer. That happens with a black police officer. Um, so there are all these other issues that are real problematic and real kind of funky. Um, but then there's the larger issues that I was mostly concerned with in the book 
of of a person's soul, no mm-hmm. matter whether they're a police officer or a teacher, uh, in terms of how they take responsibility for what they've done and how they go on in the aftermath of committing an act like this. Right, and therefore after. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we can share an excerpt from the book after. Hi, I'm Malik Yoba, and I play a cop on TV. When I was in high school, I got shot at point-blank range by another kid. My life almost ended. Each day, 10 kids are shot dead. Call 1-800-WE-PREVENT for information on what you can do to help. Not one more lost life. Not one more grieving family. Not one more. Getting shot changed my life. Don't wait for something to happen to you to take action. Get involved now. Not everyone gets a second chance. A message from the U.S. Department of Justice, the Crime Prevention Coalition, and the Ad Council. Okay, we are back in the studio, and I am on the telephone with Marita Golden. I'm Brenda Green, and this is Writers on Writing. I want to thank Antoine Heat for our public service announcement, um, just focused on 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 the fact that, that youth are, are getting shot and to do something to change that. So it's very appropriate to this subject that we are discussing in uh, Marita Golden's most recent book, After. After. So Marita, when we left, you were talking about being concerned about the soul um, in this book and the soul, what happens to this character in the aftermath of this tragedy in his life and in the lives of the people in this family. Mm Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, and well, you know, it's interesting. When the book first came out, I was interviewed uh, on a show in New York by uh, hosted by these two brothers, and I was very pleased that they really got what the book was really about, just as you do. But they were saying that they felt that it was a very important book for black men to read because so much of the book is about this character's ability and willingness to change, change in his relationship to his son change in terms of accepting responsibility for what he did um, and acknowledge uh, the role that his own uh, views may have played in what happened that night. Uh, so, But the section I'm going to read deals with uh, the night of the shooting, and he comes home after the shooting, after several hours of dealing with sort of the administrative aftermath. He comes home, and it was really important for me to establish that, that like all police officers, this, this man has a family, he has a wife, he has children, um, and so that he's more than his badge, he's more than his gun, he's more than his uniform. And so I'm just going to read a little section from the part of the book where he comes home that night. Uh, at 5.30 a.m., Carson unlocks the door to his house, weak with a desire to see the faces of his children. It is a desire that fills him like hunger, like thirst. He walks quietly in the dark to his twin daughter's room, which he painted pink for their birthday. The nightlight plugged into the wall socket casts an eerie frosting of muted half-light over the room's darkness. Barbie posters claim nearly all the space on the walls. Stuffed teddy bears, dolls, and beanie babies are scattered all over the carpeted floor. Standing in the doorway, Carson is stunned by the cheeriness of the room, and it nearly buckles his knees. Nearly sends him crashing onto the floor, but he steadies himself and walks to the bed of Roseanne, lying on her side, sucking her thumb reflexively in her sleep, her body curled snail-like beneath the sheet. Carson wipes the tiny beads of sweat from her forehead with his fingertips. Leaning closer, he listens to the heavy grunt of her breathing. He closes his eyes and allows that sound, the slightly asthmatic, ragged breathing of his daughter, to drench him like rain. After a few moments, Carson pads softly over to Rosalind's bed. She is sprawled on her back, arms and legs akimbo. A gentle fluttering of her eyes behind her closed lids makes it seem as though she's merely feigning sleep. Rosalind's left leg twitches several times, and she turns on her side. In Juwan's room, the boy sleeps too, a copy of Treasure Island tucked beneath his pillow. Carson stares at the face, slack with sleep. He looks deeply into the face of the sun, that he is sure, even before this night, he's already lost. Carson stands outside Juwan's room door and considers the steps he will have to take to enter the room where his wife, Bunny, sleeps. The thought of those steps fills his mind like a forced march. 
when he wakes up at 7 a.m., maybe, just maybe, he will have a reprieve until then. He knows he won't be that lucky, but walks back downstairs anyway, slumping into a chair at the breakfast nook in the kitchen. He is more than tired, feels an ache that is primordial and awful in his bones and in his skin. He'd like to make a cup of coffee, but doesn't want to make any movements that would signal that he's home. There have been other times in his 12 years in the force when he was hours late because of a fatal accident. Sometimes he had a chance to call, sometimes he didn't. But he knew that this was part of the job. Shit happened, so she would have guessed Carson convinces himself that shit happened last night to someone else. If he can just be alone for a while so that he doesn't have to face Bunny to tell her what he did, even if alone means having nothing and no one to distract him from the images and the memories of the shooting plane over and over in his head, a videotape that on the ride home he promised that he would only allow to play for 15 minutes of every hour, a promise he has absolutely no power to keep. So that in a scene scene like that, you really get to the heart of the impact of uh, that incident, that, that an incident like that, a shooting like that, has many, many, many victims. And uh, I was, in my research, I was told by police officers, the stories of police officers who had killed themselves, who committed suicide, um, because they had killed someone uh, in the line of duty. Uh, police officers who had had mental breakdowns and, and resigned, they simply felt they could not perform their jobs anymore. And this is a part of the job that, of course, is hidden from the public. Um, and that even many police officers don't fully understand. Right. Have you had any, um, that, that really does captivate, you know, the, the complicated nature, as you said, the internal struggles that you go through. You really, really feel what he's going through. Um, have you had any responses from police officers? Oh, yes. And they have thanked me for the book. They thanked me for the, uh, the richness of the characterization, the complexity of my uh, grappling with all of these moral issues of guilt, responsibility, professionalism, family. And uh, I always tell them in response that I was only able to write the book with that level of understanding because so many police officers opened their hearts to me. That is, when I talked to these police officers, I did not approach them as the enemy, as bad guys. I simply approached them as people who had a story to tell me about why they wanted to be a police officer, what were the best things, what were the worst things. And they were so open with me, uh, and that enabled me to create this character. Right. As you were talking, I was thinking about how so many um, police officers, as do teachers and nurses and doctors, go into want to be a police officer to help save their community. Exactly. Exactly. Violence. They want to serve. And uh, one of the things that we don't talk about in our community is is the real challenges of serving in the black community. You're talking about subverts, uh, serving in many communities that are deeply impoverished, and I don't mean just impoverished in terms of economics, but impoverished spiritually, impoverished intellectually, so that when, when things happen in our community, police officers often find that our community doesn't cooperate with them in terms of solving the crime. We have a skewed, corrupt morality in our community, in many pockets of our community, around, quote, snitching. Yes. And so that there are all these these issues that prevent police officers from actually serving the communities. And we, it's very easy for us to really focus on these really horrible cases like Sean Bell and like Amity, which we know are travesties which we know call out for a reexamination of policing in our community. But there's the other side of the equation where in these communities, because of our issues, our psychological issues, our spiritual issues, we often fail to enable the police to protect us in the way that we should be protected. This is um, part of of one of the resounding themes in your work, which um, which leads me to the the next question. What do you see um, as your role as the writer? 
how would you define your role as the writer and and um does the writer have a responsibility you know the the age-old question (laughs) well i mean for me from my very earliest uh days as a writer i was pretty clear about what i wanted to do and i think this is something that each writer has to address individually and for me i felt that i was a storyteller and that the particular story that i had to tell was of the uh, the beauty, richness, complexity of my people. And so that I'm, a, I'm an African-American woman writer, and I see all of those as strengths that, that empower me. And so my writing is political, it's, a, it's psychological, it's all of those things. Um, and I don't have a problem embracing all of that. Um, I'm not a, you know, when people say arts for arts, sake and mm-hmm. yes. art is not political well of course art is political writers may not want to acknowledge that it's political or or say that it is but that doesn't mean that it isn't but i'm a writer who has has had no problem uh from the very beginning of my career talking about the ways in which family and history is political and i can still be a storyteller who's telling a universal human story at the same time that's right. Very true. Very true. You also, can you share with the audience your work with the Hearst and Wright Foundation, which you founded? Well, yeah. For the last uh, 17 years, I've been president and co-founder of the, well, I am co-founder, but I've been serving as president of the Hearst and Wright Foundation. And um, we've done a lot of really wonderful things in terms of creating opportunities for for black writers, the black writing community, both nationally and internationally. Our website is www.hurston, like Zora Neale Hurston, right, like Richard Wright, hurstonwright.org. And uh, we have a summer writing workshop. We give an annual uh, national award that recognizes <coughs> the best published black writers. Uh, we give an annual award to black college writers, and we just started a summer program for high school writers as well. So uh, we've had a major impact uh, in terms of creating opportunities, honoring writers, and keeping alive the vibrant, uh, necessary story that uh, black writers have to tell. Right. There's so many people I I meet now, um, particularly our emerging writers, who said, well, I got my start at the Hurston Wright um, Summer Institute. <laughs> so you really, you really are having a major impact. Yeah, on writers. and it's very, it's very satisfying. Right. So I want to really, really thank you. And um, do you have, as we come to a close, I want to encourage our listening audience to go out and purchase. Um, after is this still in the hardcover? 